from the Gospel according to St. Mark, the ninth chapter, verses 2 through 9. Hear the word of God. Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and led them up to a high mountain apart by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his clothes became dazzling white, such as no one on earth could bleach them. And there appeared to them Elijah with Moses, who were talking with Jesus. Then Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not know what to say, for they were terrified. Then a cloud overshadowed them, and from the cloud there came a voice, This is my son, the beloved. Listen to him. Suddenly, when they looked around, they saw no one with them, with them anymore, but only Jesus. As they were coming down the mountain, he ordered them to tell no one about what they had seen until after the Son of Man had risen from the dead. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Please be seated. There are times, not many of them to be sure, but there are times when everything in your life seems to come together and you feel like, yes, this is it. This is how things are supposed to be. You can see things clearly. You understand in a way that you never could understand before. It may be a season of time or it may be only a moment. But those times that come upon us, most often unexpectedly and uninvited, are moments of extraordinary grace. I have only had a few of them in my life, but they will never be forgotten. Peter, James, and John had such an experience, alone with Jesus in the solitude of a mountaintop. It all came together for them. In the briefest moment, they had confirmed that what they had dared to hope about Jesus and tentatively had come to believe about Jesus was God's own truth. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. The Gospel account cannot begin to do full justice to the mystical experience that was theirs. Jesus was transfigured before them and his clothes became dazzling white, such as no one on earth could bleach them, giving them a glimpse of his eternal glory. With him they saw Moses and Elijah representing the law and the prophets, clearly revealing to them that Jesus was the fulfillment of both. But the clincher was, the voice from the luminous cloud that overshadowed them, and the voice declared, This is my son, the beloved. Listen to him. Whatever questions or lingering doubts they may have had evaporated. They were never sure about anything else in all of their lives. But then it was over just as quickly and unexpectedly as it had begun. And standing there before them was Jesus. Jesus said, as he has always been, in his flesh, in his clothes. Just as our moments, though not nearly as dramatic as theirs, are never forgotten, this was a moment that none of them would ever forget as well. Yet it doesn't take long for the clarity of the moment to be swallowed by the realities of everyday life. For life and faith are lived out not on the isolation of the mountaintop, but on the plain, where the questions often are more numerous than the answers, where bad things happen to the best of people, where pain intrudes upon our pleasure and sorrow shadows our joy and where our faith is tried and tested. Life happens. Things intrude. 
the straight path becomes a treacherously winding mountain pass and uncertainty hovers. After that moment of the mountaintop, the disciples thought they knew what Jesus was all about. They even began to map out their future with him, arguing among themselves about who would sit at his right hand and his left hand in the places of honor and power in the kingdom they were certain he had come to establish. But as they listened to him, as the voice of the cloud had commanded, they became more and more concerned because what they heard Jesus saying did not square with what they understood about him. They knew what Messiah was all about, or so they thought. And Jesus was going about things all wrong. Messiah was to restore Israel to a place of prominence among the nations, casting off the shackles of Rome's control and ushering in the reign of God on earth. Jesus, though, kept talking about rejection and suffering and death. After this, they were on the road going up to Jerusalem, Mark tells us, and Jesus was walking ahead of them like a man on a mission. And they were amazed. And those who followed him were afraid. He took the twelve aside and again began to tell them what was to happen to him, saying, See, we are going up to Jerusalem. And the Son of Man will be handed over to the chief priest and the scribes, and they will condemn him to death. Then they will hand him over to the Gentiles, who will flock him and spit upon him and flog him and kill him. And after three days he will rise again. Let me tell you something. That was the farthest thing from their imagination. In fact, when Jesus said it, it seemed so useless, such a waste, so unchristlike. The folly, of course, is in believing that we know Jesus better than Jesus knows himself. It's safer that way, less demanding, less likely to be sacrificial. We define Jesus or redefine Jesus in terms of our expectations and our wants. Nowhere is that more succinctly revealed than in what I like to call bumper sticker theology. Jesus loves everybody, but I'm his favorite. Jesus is my co-pilot, but I'm still in the driver's seat. Jesus was a liberal. Jesus told me Republicans suck. <laughs> Jesus is my homie. Jesus is a hippie. Thank you, baby Jesus, for a smoking hot wife. <laughs> a pickup truck I saw parked in our local cross-cultural retail center, Walmart, sported two stickers on the rear window. On the left side, it displayed a a picture of an AK-47 with caption saying, Assault Life, while the other side showed a cross with the caption, Christ Life. And I wondered if the owner had any idea, any idea at all, of the screaming contradiction between the two. Church signs are sometimes no better. A few days before Valentine's Day, I saw one that asked, Will you be my Valentine? Signed, Jesus. Jesus doesn't want you to be his Valentine. What Jesus does want is for you to be his disciple. And if you are his disciple, then it is he who leads you, and not you who lead him. And he who shapes you, and not you who shape him. 
You see, we are disciples on Jesus' terms, not ours. Listen to him, said the voice to the disciples. And when they did, they didn't, le- didn't particularly like what they heard. Rejection, suffering, and death were not at all what they anticipated or wanted of the Messiah. Jerusalem was to be the place of the coronation, not his defeat and death. Oh, they preferred their version of Jesus to the real Jesus. But still they followed. When we listen to him, really listen to him, we discover, like them, that what we have in mind about Jesus is not always the same as what Jesus has in mind. We look to him to save us, to save us from the fear and the reality of death, to save us from pain and hardship, to see us through hard times, to comfort us in our sorrow, to heal our wounds, and to make us whole. And he does. But Jesus also calls us to take up things that we would rather leave untaken and to give up things that we would rather not let go. Attitudes, values, and behaviors that have become second nature to us, but which really are quite unchrist like He calls us to love our enemies even the ones we hate the most. He calls us to forgive those who do not deserve our forgiveness, to to help the neighbor who is in need, whoever the scoundrel may be, to forego the desire for revenge and to strive to live in peace with all. We try. God knows we try. But sometimes, in spite of our best efforts, still we fail him. And sometimes, to be absolutely honest, we consciously choose to disobey him. The amazing thing is that in spite of our faithlessness, still Jesus calls us to follow him. Still, Jesus entrusts to our care his ministry on the earth. When you think about it that way, Jesus shows far more faith in you and me than we ever can in him. We walk by faith and not by sight, the scripture reminds us, and it's true. We know it is true. Because while there is much we understand, there is even more that we do not. It doesn't always add up what Jesus says and does. It doesn't always make sense what Jesus says and does. It seems to me, though, that one of the gifts that we carry with us, especially in those times, is the memory of the moments when it did, when we saw Jesus clearly, as clearly as any mortal can see, and we understood, we were convinced. Ultimately, though, faith is not about so much about understanding, but about trusting Jesus enough to follow him wherever He happens to lead you. To God be glory now and forever. Amen.